Now, I think, I think Hamza said something when he started. He said, have an open mind. And I remember reading somewhere that someone said that the mind works like the parachute best when it's open. And you know, the Zen Buddhists have this mantra, right? They try and achieve, their lifelong aim is to achieve what they call a don't know mind. And some of the most enlightened monks spend hours during the day repeating this one mantra, what was my name before I was born? Can you imagine? They keep asking themselves, what was my name before I was born? So I just wanted to say, in journeying through life, we need to remember, it's helpful to remember that perhaps we don't know what life is all about. And the only way, and if we, and if we realize that we don't know enough, we would keep our minds open, as Hamza said, and perhaps our minds would be open enough to learn from everything around us. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about gears in the universe. Now, I haven't timed myself, so somebody's got to, I better keep time myself, all right. I'm told that if you go beyond 18 minutes, you're punished terribly in a TED talk. So I've got to be careful. Never been in a TED talk before. I didn't even know what it was all about. A gear. I'm going to talk about gears in the universe. Now, a gear is something that gives you power. If you're in a sports car, let's not talk about the Ferrari because it's not good news. Maybe if you're in a Lambo, you move from first gear to sixth gear, you get a lot of power. You can move from 20 kilometers per hour to 360 kilometers per hour. And so, you know, many people achieve outcomes in their life that are disproportionate to the amount of time they have with them. And that's because they've discovered some gear in the universe that gives them that power and the fulcrum, acts as a fulcrum to achievement. All right, so I'm just going to talk about some gears that perhaps I've experienced in my life or seen work in what I've seen. But you know, you may journey on and get intimate with far more gears. And perhaps you, you could... Wow, this has gone to the last slide. Wow. Now, what is that? Okay, I'm going to talk about first the hard gear. You know, if you were to talk to one of these Zen Buddhists who are enlightened, who meditated on that mantra we spoke about for many years, they will tell you that your mind is illusion. You know, when I first heard that, I probably still don't understand it very well, but when I first heard it, I definitely didn't understand it. Your mind is maya. And if you read the, the Indian continent philosophies, the European philosophies, the Tao philosophies, and the other philosophies of the Yellow Emperor, they will say the same thing. They will also tell you that you are not your mind. That's staggering, isn't it? If I'm not my mind, what the hell am I? Now, to the extent that you and I don't understand why the realized beings in the world say this, to, to that extent, wisdom eludes us. Now, the corollary to that is that if you lived your, lived your life driven by your mind, the logical dictates of your mind, I'm afraid we are going to get lost. And the symptom of that is just one thing. There's one clue that tells you if you're lost. In any part of your life, you would experience a lack of joy in that part of your life. So probably we were all not meant to do exams, huh? If you're a student from VJC, certainly there's no joy in doing an exam unless you're one of those brilliant students who wants to use that as an opportunity to show how brilliant you are. So I think that the first gear is become familiar with the hard gear. Anything that you do when you love someone, you don't love them out of your head. You feel the love here. If you feel sadness at something that happens in your life, you, again, you feel the sadness here. Why is it that every time you want to make a major decision, you go here? If you drive your life through here, which the, the realized beings say is Maya, you're going to land up like an animated vegetable, like a talking broccoli. No passion, all action. 
Okay, so the first thing I think is, in the people that I've studied, I've realized that those who are passionate about what they do have a wild and grand life. The question is, can you or I live like that? Okay, let's talk about another gear, since I only have 18 minutes. Parito's gear. There was this uh, obscure, at one time obscure, Italian economist born in 1848, died in 1923. His name was Vilfredo Palito. He was an economist and he discovered that he was an Italian, right? So he had nothing to do. He did a lot of research and decide, discovered that 80% of the land in Italy was owned by 20% of the population. And like that, he did studies on uh, other phenomena in life and discovered it had an 80-20. You've heard of the 80-20 principle. It's the Pareto gear. Now, each one of us in this room today, if we were to study the results that we get in our life, we will discover, if we looked hard enough, that 80% of our results come from 20% of our efforts. Now, it may not be 80-20, it may be 90-10, it may be 95-5, but you get the point. It's a disproportionate amount of outcome being generated by a far lesser amount of effort. So if you wanted to unleash this gear in your life, you need, need to analyze yourself. You know, maybe that large chunk of the 80 is spent in front of the goggle box. Right, But, you know, if you, again, you know, you see the life of people who are extremely successful and dynamic, you will find that they employ Pareto's gear at varying levels. Just imagine, if you took your, if you discovered what your 20% was, if you discovered, right, tomorrow, which 20% produces your 80% and junk everything else, the 80% that produces the 20%, junk it. And just double your 20%. And you would get your 40%. You would, that means you would work 60% less or struggle 60% less and double your, almost double your outcome. More than double your outcome. Well, almost double, sorry. Yeah, it's not exactly double because you ditched your 20%, right? Mathematics was always not my strong suit. And I'll share with you that, you know, I'm a trial lawyer. And I've been a trial lawyer for 25 years. And I've studied my clients. And I study, you know, everyone who goes, you know, I, I come into contact with. And it's amazing. To the extent that you master the Pareto gear in your own life, to that extent you will have access to huge amounts of power. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about some time gears. You know, practically all of us have this no time conversation running through our heads, right? We end the day like, no time. You want to do this, got no time. You want to do that, you got no time. You know, it's strange. We, have, we are the highest form of intelligence on this planet. And as far as we know, until we discover the, you know, a Martian or something like that, we are still the highest evolved form of intelligence in the universe up to now, right? We, we haven't discovered anything else. And yet we have this no-time conversation. Think about it, right? When T-Rex roamed the Earth, guess how many hours there was in a day? If you're the President of the United States, Obama, he works, he runs a country on the same amount of time that you have, right? Having a no time conversation, isn't it like going to an elephant saying, how come you don't have enough tasks? Huh? Or picking up your hand and saying, how come I don't have enough fingers? It's a ridiculous conversation. There's 24 hours to a day and when the day ends, night starts, night stops and day start, starts again.
but we still have that ridiculous conversation in our heads. Because they're generated by your mind. Your mind, by the way, the masters tell you, is a computer loaned to you while your body has breath in it. Now, so let's talk about this time gear, right? If you're going to have a meaningful relationship with time, um, one of the things I think that, that uh, firstly, we, we need to have a meaningful relationship with time and not have a conversation that says there's not enough time. Uh, one of the things that I think, you know, um, uh, you know, if you journey, you will discover is, you know, you, you may have heard about it, the circadian rhythm. And if you study the circadian rhythm, it will tell you that, uh, for instance, at some point in the afternoon for most of us, your system feels like shutting down. You will feel it, right? <laughs> you will feel it. <laughs> and sometimes you call it uh, after meals too poor or something like that. Huh? They, they call it the insulin effect. It may not be that, all right? It's just that your body telling you take a break. And studies have shown that if you take a 5 to 15 or 20 minute nap during the afternoon, you will cut down your sleep time by between 45 minutes to an hour and a half. That's a huge saving. Okay, that's a huge saving. Um, and then, you know, uh, you probably, if you want to master this, you need to really master your circadian rhythm. I, if, you, if you didn't know what your circadian rhythm was, then you're, you know, you're not optimizing your energy and your metabolism, right? Now, the eight-minute vortex, um, I just want to share this with you because, uh, you know, I have a colleague in the office Sorry. Okay, who, thank you, who leaves the office at 4 a.m. practically every day? I don't know how he does it. Now. Then he comes back to the office at about 9 or 9.30. He will tell you that he doesn't have enough time, okay? So I've learned that if you want to learn, say, music, you want to do anything, apply the eight-minute vortex. If you wanted to learn the guitar, pick it up for eight minutes every day, and you'll be a master musician in no time. If you don't believe it, try it. I'm told I've got uh, five minutes, so let me spend it on my last gear. Distinction Fireball. Let me introduce you to Makaritan. I was playing soccer with him in 2003 when this happened. It was in Woodlands Wellington Stadium. I was running towards him. The ball was headed to him, so I was going to tackle him. It looked like somebody flicked off the light. He just toppled over. We didn't have a defibrillator, unfortunately, in those days. He died. He was 42 years old a week ago. And before the game, he was telling me how a week before that, he had gone for a full medical and the doctor said, hey, okay, you're ready for takeoff. Let me introduce you now to Emil Frenner. Now, this picture I took in 2009 in what is reputed to be the coldest mountain on earth. Denali or Mount McKinley in Alaska. Now, this is Emil Frenner. At that time, when we climbed this mountain, just two of us, it took us about a month and uh, five days to climb this mountain. People said I was crazy because we had to carry just the two of us. No, I mean, in the Himalayas, we have Sherpas, but in uh, Alaska, no hope, okay? It's too fly to, too, okay. He was 70 years old then, and I had trouble keeping up with him. He climbed Everest when he was 64 and 67, okay? I, I'm afraid I don't have too much time to talk to you about Emil. Now, this lady, she just died. In March this year, she was born at the reign of the Manchu Qing dynasty. And up to August last year, she would wake up at 4 a.m., do two hours of meditation and calisthenics, and then spend, she leave the house at 10 a.m., Come back at 8, she lives alone. Her niece, I think, comes in and checks in on her once a, once a week or so. She would volunteer at two homes, one of which she helped to start. So you will find her at 2 a.m., 2 p.m., feeding a 70-year-old, or at 5 p.m., bathing a 76-year-old. Amazing, isn't it? Now, I want to ask you this. Huh? If you could live as long as Resha Su, maybe not 113, maybe 100 also enough, right? Now, just remember, 
Tell me when I've got a minute, all right? I don't want to get punished. Einstein said, if you ex do the same thing and expect a different result, you're insane. So if you saw that guy, Makari, right, whom I introduced, if you went and talked to him, you said, what, did, what, what does Makari eat every day? And if you ate what he ate, and you expect to be like Teresa Su, then you're insane, right? Then expect to die early. Have your arteries clogged. Have no energy. Don't expect, him, expect to be like Emil climbing Everest at the age of 67. And if you studied it hard enough, you'll find that meat eating kills you. I used to love bakwa, you know, I used to love uh, wonton mee. But you know, all these uh, tribes that eat meat, one minute, please trigger me. The Hunzas, 100 is like 40 for them. And there are studies, after studies, I can spend three hours with you on this, but I won't waste your time, right? Because anyway, I've got 18 minutes. Now, I want to tell you, if you could live disease-free, you see, you guys are young, right? You probably can eat tree bark, right, and lalang, and be fine. But wait until you get to my age, 48. You can't do that. Okay, so you need to think about the day when you need to use this gear. Okay, how old are you guys? 17. So about 31 years later, Come and see me. I want to see whether you have enough energy to climb a mountain. All right? And if you had it, imagine if you had that energy until you were 80, 90. Most people, when they're 50, 55, they're winding down, right? They want to retire and God knows lie on a hammock in Bali. I don't know what glory there is in that. But get to know this distinction, fireball, okay? The Bible says the hardest organ to tame is your tongue. Master it. All right? Thank you.